You are tuned into the Power Chord Hour right here on 107.9 WRFA, as well as on the Power Chord Hour podcast. However you're listening to this, thank you much for tuning in. I'm your host, Anthony Merchant, and we got a couple new episodes for you in February. Excited right now to be talking to Jonathan Anastas of DYS and Slapshot. We are talking DYS's debut album, Brotherhood. It just got re-released for its 40th anniversary on Bridge Nine Records. We will uh, talk Brotherhood, some more music, and uh, just everything in general with Jonathan. Jonathan, how are you doing? Great. Thank you for having me. It's a rare rainy day in Los Angeles today. <laughs> it's a uh, it's not a rare cold day here in Western New York. We definitely it's about maybe 20 something degrees here today. It is freezing out. So happy to be inside nice and warm talking to you. <laughs> Excellent. Happy to be here. So, I mean, let's, uh, you know, talk about a lot of things, but again, the, the big thing right now, DYS, the uh, Brotherhood album 40 year anniversary edition is out. Uh, how long was this reissue in the works? Is this something that just kind of you got, it's like, hey, this is happening. And it was pretty quick. Or is this some kind of like, you know, thing in the making for a while where it was kind of like, you know, it, it was in the works for a bit before, you know, the, the public got it. How did that kind of work? Well, we've lived in a strange world for the last couple of years, right? You know, with the pandemic and everything that's gone on. So DYS had been since 2009 in a sort of like every other year cycle of, doing some sh some shows in Europe, some festivals, and, and it becomes sort of pretty regular. And then the pandemic happened and, you know, all live music got shut down for a couple of years and we took a hiatus and my wife and I adopted a son. And so I have to admit it kind of crept up on me. All of a sudden, the 40th anniversary was creeping up and I really wanted to honor the record and honor my bandmates and honor the scene. So we emerged from the pandemic and I realized that the 40th anniversary is sort of upon us. And I started having conversations with various labels that would make sense. And we had a pre-existing relationship with Bridge Nine. They had a merch deal first with us when we thought we were just doing a couple of reunion shows that turned into a live record that turned into a series of digital singles. I've always been very impressed with Chris Wren and his crew in terms of how they bridge, you know, having great love for old hardcore and an understanding of the scene that it came from. But they're also not just a reissue label. They stay very current on new bands. They've broken new bands. They've made new bands. They understand how the music industry works today. They understand digital. They understand the interplay of vinyl and digital. And so I think they have an understanding of today's music landscape in a way that just sort of like legacy labels don't. And after talking to a few different groups of people, it seemed like an existing relationship, a trusting relationship. And Chris had an incredible creative idea to really only print the record on one side and do a picture disc on the other, which is what makes this re-release different than other releases of this record. And why I felt that was really important is, unlike SSD, which came out 40 years ago and was gone until 40 years later, there have been some reiterations and some repackaging of this record done by Tang without the band's authorization that I think created some confusion in the marketplace um, and amongst fans. And I also think sort of lessened the impact of the record the way it was originally packaged. So I wanted this re-release to just really stand on its own and say, we took a lot of care in this. We really thought about this. We really wanted to do something important. And at some point in the process, and this is how creative processes work to me, you really just want to listen to creative ideas. Chris came to me and said, you know, the record's only 17 minutes. That's the ability for us to print it on one side and we could actually do like a picture disc on the other side. And I said, you know, it's really intriguing, Chris. What would you imagine on the other side? And he comped up what he was thinking. Chris is great at this stuff. It was across the plate. I'm a pretty picky creative person, sort of professionally coming from marketing. I have a lot of notes. I had like no notes. And I was like, amazing idea, Chris. Let's just do it. And so we ran with it. And we launched with two colors with a super limited clear and a ruby red, which was my idea for sort of like ruby is the 40th anniversary, or like ruby stone is the 40th, right? If you were married, you give somebody a ruby on the 40th. They sold out in pre-order. And we just came out and re-released like what I'll call a Boston Celtics green, second pressing of the record. And uh, I woke up this morning to find out that we'd climbed to number nine on the Cortex charts in Germany, which is just like hmm. such an honor. Like Germany's just been such an important market to hardcore and such an important market to DYS post reunion that, you know, again, I have to thank the team at Cortex and thank our German fans. And, you know, just sort of think back all these many years later that I could wake up and be on like some really influential punk stores, like top 10 list. 
40 years later just blows me away. It's uh, it's an honor. That is that is really that is sick. I mean, the I guess the question to ask, you know, I mean, I guess a little cheesy, but does it feel like 40 years? I mean, you, you know, we're talking 40 years of this, we're going to talk a lot about the album, but does it feel like 40 years? Is this one of those things where it's like almost feels like yesterday? Well, you know, it's a great cliche, but <laughs> as you age, time moves very slowly and then it moves very quickly. And as I mentioned, we've been in this really like odd wrinkle of time with the pandemic where I literally can't unpack the last five years. Like, you know, I remember doing DYS. I remember doing Sh- Slapshot. I stepped away from music for 20 years. Wow. And I came back in 2009 for something that I thought was just going to be like a one and done reunion. And that turned into, you know, this string of shows and new music and you know, limited touring, but touring nonetheless. And so, no, it doesn't feel like 40 years. And also, the strange thing about how these things work is the current iteration of DYS has been around three times longer than any other iteration of DYS, right? Like the the lineup that did Brotherhood was like two years. The lineup that did Brotherhood plus the second record with Ross was like four years or four and a half years. And the current lineup of DYS has been together for like 12 years. Like, it's just crazy. That's pretty cool. And it's also neat to like come back and have that interest still. I mean, like you're saying, to be able to come back to a band and, you know, this pre-existing material and stuff, all these decades later, people obviously still care. I mean, look, we're talking about an album for its 40th anniversary. I mean, you know, not every record gets that. And everything you release 40 years later, you get to talk about 40 years later. It's incredible. I mean, you know. I, I in no way overestimate my impact in the world musically. So so please take this this comparison for what it was. I don't know if you watched the Grammys last night. I did not so, see it. Tracy Chapman, you know, plays Fast Car, y- y- you know, the country version, you know, new version, old song, 38 years later. Song came out in 1988. She's also from Boston. And not only was it was the high point of the Grammys, but when they cut to the audience, Every musician from every genre in the audience knew every word of the song and was like singing along. And so part of it is I just think music is about a time in your life. It's about time and place. And also, frankly, I just think music overall had a different import to people 40 years ago than it did today. And that really sort of, you know, in in a, in a very way where we had like one one hundredth, if that, of the fame of Tracy Chapman. The fact that like something about a song that meant something to you 40 years ago today just somehow hits harder than my favorite song today or your favorite song today. And I don't, and it's, it's a weird combination of all those things that I just mentioned. That's cool. No, that's really cool. I mean, with that too, you know, with the record, I mean, again, obviously it has quite the following. That's why, you know, again, that's why we uh, have the re-release 40 years later, but do you remember it? Like, did it get traction from like right when the band released it? Or do you, did it kind of have a like slow build there? Like, do you remember having a good reception right <laughs> away? Or is this one of the things where like originally released versus like when it was originally released, you might not expect that it was going to have, you know, accolades this long, you know, and this later. Well, let's first start with the word traction is almost irrelevant for early hardcore, <laughs> right? Like the whole thing was so small. Like, you know, these records got pressed like a thousand at a time or two thousand at a time. And so maybe if you had two pressings, you had three thousand records or four thousand records. So the word traction has to be taken with a big giant grain of salt, right? And there's a whole lot less competitive product out there, you know, like we were very early exclaim release. But I will say that the record got really good reception in the ability of the limited world that a hardcore record could get traction, right? Like I in no way want to overstate what traction is. One of the bellwethers of then, which is going to make scale sound so laughable, is so I deeply remember having somebody borrow their family station wagon, right? Picture like 70 station wagon, woods on the side, to drive to the record plant in New Jersey and pick it up and drive it home. And I remember pulling into the bay where they're used to trucks and for, I'm sure, what was to the pressing plant, this teeny little pallet of like 2,000 records on it, right? But to us, it just seemed like incredible. And, you know, somebody took a box cutter knife and opened it up and we pulled one out and it was shrink-wrapped and it smelled like a new record. And like, I, I viscerally remember that feeling. 
And I also remember one of the things that we were taught, you know, all this stuff was word of mouth by like Ian, by Alborel from SSD was like, try to sell as many of the records as you can on the way home. And what that meant is like, stop at distributors like Caroline, right? Or alternative tentacles, stop at record stores like the rat cage, you know, like Newbury comics. And the goal was to get home with as few records as possible. And you talk about traction in its own crazy limited way where we only pressed 2000. We got home, I believe with less than 500 of them. Right. So, so, uh, so we had 500 records of which to dispose of. And many of those just kind of went out in onesies and twosies like mail order, but it was gone very quickly. And again, you know, it's a strange idea of hardcore where like everything to your point about like, do you think it would be around 40 years later? Like things felt disposable, not in a bad way, but it's like, we're on to the next. And this is sort of like what we, I was probably disproportionately influenced by Al Burrell who repressed nothing, right? Like kids of other say is done. We're on to like, get it away. Get away is done. We're on to like, and so I was probably disproportionately influenced to not do another pressing and like, oh, we're on to something else. And then especially we were going through this musical transformation into another genre. So I think we were especially interested in kind of moving on and what the next thing would sound like. Yeah. The, uh, you know, kind of speaking of sound, I wanted to ask that too, you know, with DYS, I mean, you know, now you guys, I mean, including with this record, I mean, it is, it is such a classic, including like straight edge, hardcore, like how, I guess I like asking this, it's your debut record. Like how defined, was the DYS sound, would you say, when the band formed? Is this one of those things where you actually talked about it before you started playing? Or is it more of a band where this sound gets bashed out as you all get in the room and just start playing together? And that's kind of how the sound forms. You know, how did that kind of go in the early days? Well, in the early days, like most bands, the songs were written pre-recording, right? So even the word road tested sounds a bit ridiculous given like the scale of hardcore at that time, but all of those songs had been played live, right? Had been workshopped live. We had some sense of, you know, which ones got more resonance than others, but we were naive, right? There was no like really working on the arrangement. There was no, like, it was really to us about two things. Can you make it through a take without a mistake? As sad as that sounds, right? But that was like objective number one, take, playback, was there some egregious error? There wasn't. Do we want another take? Do we want to move on, right? Working under another budget. And then the second one was Sonics, right? About like, do we like that drum sound? Do we like that guitar sound? But there was zero conversation about, are you in the pocket? Are you in the groove? Do you want to pull this back, right? Like, oh, like that, do you want to double up those choruses? That happened later, you know, a little bit on the second record where we had, you know, Lou Giordano who produced that record, really made his bones and his fame as an engineer. And he was an excellent engineer for that time frame. But especially at that time in his career, his mindset wasn't like a producer. Like, I don't recall, he didn't come to rehearsals. Where we made the second record, our producers showed up at rehearsals and made, you know, uh, arrangement suggestions, right? It wasn't like Mutt Lang, who's like rewriting your songs, but they were making arrangement suggestions. And I also remember they were very big on getting us to turn down. We were like into huge stacks at those days and like we would play in rehearsal way too loud. And just even turning down in rehearsal and like finding the mistakes that that were hidden in volume. And none of that happened on the first record. And so again, you know, and and I've, I've said this before, but one of the incredible things about DIY is that there are no gatekeepers, right? Like if you have the idea and the songs and a little bit of money, you could make a record. That's great. It's also terrible. Like no gatekeepers mean, that's not really a song. Like, do you want to go work on that some more? Or like, where's the hook in that one, right? Or like, are you in the groove? Or, you know, like the classic, like Aerosmith used to hear, like, I don't hear a single here, go hire Diane Warren. Like there's a whole dark side to that. But also I kind of feel like if that record had been workshop for another year, right? If we weren't quite as DIY as we weren't quite as like ambitious as we were, would it have been a better record? Maybe yes, maybe no, I don't know. But that's the double-edged sword, right, of DIY where we come back at it later and, you know, people have varying opinions on our post-reunion stuff. That stuff was done in a much more disciplined manner 
with a producer who's got platinum records on their wall, with a band who has platinum records on their wall, right? Franz, you know, had a platinum record with with the Foo Fighters. Al Pahana's got a platinum record with Power Man 5000. You know, Al and Adam went to Berkeley. Like, I'm lear- I'm relearning or learning things the first time with those guys. Like, that is the first time I actually felt like I was in a studio where we were approaching it with that kind of thing, right? With, like, uh, you know how do we get the best possible musical product out of it? Right. So there was none of that on the first record. Do you let, so like when you guys went in, I take it was brotherhood when it was time to record, was it pretty much fleshed out? This doesn't sound like it was an album where like, you're like toying around too much in studio or writing too much in studio. Is it pretty much ready to go when it was time to record? It was ready to go when it was time to record. And I'm going to give you another ridiculous example of not knowing what we didn't know. (laughs) When we first made that record, Wolfpack was not on it. Now, normally, if you were thinking like even the music industry back then, that was our radio demo. So call that our single, right? So it's got some local traction. In a normal music industry world, you would say, hey, we've got some traction on that song. Let's be sure to include that. Our naive take was the world has already heard that song. There's no need to include it. And in fact, we're lessening the value of the product to the consumer because there's one less new thing on there. And that's literally how naive we were, right? <laughs> and later we ended up re-recording it at Radio Beat with that lineup and and actually with Husker Du on background vocals. Nice. So the first repackaging of this record that was done by Tang without our authorization was the original radio demo, which was done at a different time, different studio, sonically feels nothing like it. And then the version we ended up with Chris was the radio version of Wolfpack, with that lineup, with Husker Du and background vocals. So it actually feels to me honest and genuine to include it sort of as part of that package. It's what we should have done the first time around. And we were just too <laughs> stupid to do it right. Was there a lot of, would you say there's a lot of trial and error during this era of the band? I mean, obviously it's the beginning, not only on this album, but it's the debut and you guys aren't around very long before it comes out. I mean, you feel like you learned a lot kind of during this part that you maybe applied later on, you know, for the rest of DYS. I think we learned a lot about what not to do. I mean, we did some things, right? But we learned about what not to do. I, I think our learning and how to make a record actually started with our second record, like in terms of actually how to make a record. And I think that continued to evolve, you know, through our, our different iterations. You know, I mean, we were li- like, think about it. I was 15 years old. Like, I'm literally, this, I'm trying to figure out how to be a person, like forget how to like be a musician. And, you know, there were some things that we did, we took a lot of thought over, like, there was a lot of talk about sequencing, right? Because I think people who grew up in the digital era don't think about a record had two sides. And it was always about like the opening and the closing track on each side were like super important. Oh, yeah. And like what sequence, what story were you telling across the eight or the 10 songs, right? And so we put a lot of time into the idea of sequencing that record. And I will actually have to say, I probably wouldn't sequence it any differently today. Um, I think we sequenced it properly, but there was a whole lot of conversation about that when there should have been more conversation about songwriting, probably Um, more conversation about Sonics, but we didn't know what we didn't know. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, actually with the sequencing, I mean, was there ever a point like where the, where there was a totally drastic, uh, different kind of track listing for it? Was there ever before the final one we know, did you guys ever have one where it was like, it was almost settled on and it was like totally flipped upon, you know, the track listing we have now. I can't remember. I mean, I'm sure like in any band with four or five opinions, they were like dissenting opinions, but I don't remember like a radically different. Nothing crazy. You, you, know, you know, I think again, that became more of an issue with the second record where all of a sudden we've got a power ballad and it's like, where do you put the power ballad? Mm. Uh, <laughs> you know, as a hardcore band with a power ballad. But, uh, you know, I think we were just really trying to open and close with songs that were kind of either popular or demonstrative of the sound or the record or whatever. But again, like we're giving this all too much credit 40 years later. Like really when I look back, like my primary emotional response is thinking about a bunch of 15 to 17 year olds hanging onto an edge by their fingernails, like trying not to fall off into the abyss as we, you know, try to make a record. Was it, I mean, was it still like, I, I guess again, like sounds like I'm more professional on like the second record, but I mean, overall was the, was it at least a fun experience doing that? Was it, was it, cause I feel like I get two. either doing your first record was an enjoyable recording experience or it was such like a pain and just so much stress and stuff doing it. It wasn't something you totally got to enjoy till it was over, you know, like 
where did that kind of fall for you? Could you enjoy this while you were making it? Or was it more fun once it was done and you could listen to the product? I think we were all just thrilled to be able to make a record, right? I mean, it was like having a record was a big deal back then, right? There weren't home studios, you know, yeah. though Spotify wasn't flooded with a million new songs a day that nobody listens to. Like having, you know, so I go back to, as I said before, holding the physical product, like we made this, we birthed this was probably like the greatest, you know, moment. Or maybe when we finished it and like listened to the last mastering you know, for the first time, because we knew nothing, you know, I think we were very excited to be there, but also, you know, there was tension, you know, and like in any band, there's always tension over like, who's the leader, whose decisions matter more. And we, you know, as hardcore bands did, we sort of left that on there. Like at some point you hear Dave Collins yelling at me, right. Cause like, you know, we're on a budget, we're on time, you know, you gotta hear like, bip, 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 bip. and I'm like, Dave. And he's like, what? I'm trying to fix my drumstick dick. You know, like there, <laughs> like we left that on there, you know, there, that was of course a bit of that, you know? That is great. That is really, that is fun. I mean, again, and like you said, I mean, you're 15. That's insane. I, I can't imagine. I mean, at 15, I screwed around with friends, you know, and like are in a, in a basement playing music, but not going to a studio recording it, nor is it anything that uh, I think Bridge Nine Records would uh, re-release 40 years later either. It's obviously a little magic there, but uh, there's yeah. a little magic there. I mean, the crazy thing for me is I go back and I think about, you know, to my detriment, I had pretty much given up on high school by then. I mean, I, I made a token effort for the classes I want. And you can imagine a world, you know, sort of pre where we are now with smartphones. I would go back to school after being gone for a week, 15, maybe 16 now. And they'd be like, where were you for the last week, Mr. Anastas? And I'd be like, I was touring the Northeast. And they'd be like, yeah, right. Sure. Sure. You were touring. The, you know, and I'd pull some folded up flyer out of my pocket to try to prove to them that I had like five shows in five days. So I'm not like suspended for not being at school. And I'm kind of like, yeah, I had a tour. Like I can't be in two places at once. And I, I can't even imagine having that conversation today. I'm, I'm dreading the day that I am paid back for that when my son is doing things like that. And I'm going to, and it's going to be like, but dad, I toured the world. And I'm going to be like, what? <laughs> I mean, cause you, the, I like talking about this too. And I mean, I think I already kind of know the answer, but like, even when you think about touring back in the day when you did and just how you did things, recording music and all that, it's almost seems like totally different from now. Like, could you, do you even think like DYS would do things in the same way if you started today? Or could you even like, I feel like it's a whole different environment. It's a whole different, how you get your music out there, how you record and all. I mean, the fact you could even record at home now, it's like, is any of that crazy even to think about? It has to be so different from how you would have did it 40 years ago. Well, here's the funny thing. I'm going to tell you about how it's the same. Yes, I'm gonna tell I like you how it's, too. And, I, and I'm going to tell you how it's different. So how it's different, obviously, is like you would get in a van. And we were touring at the van level then. You would get in a van with a map book of the nation and no phone. And you would be on faith that you would get to this venue and the show would still exist when you got there. And the venue would go on faith that you would arrive and you would play a show. And there's no real checking in for breaking down. Like if you break down within a walk of like a payphone, you can call the club and be like, the van broke down. And somebody in the club gets on the stage and be like, the van broke down. They're two hours away or whatever, right? But like, I can't leave my house to like go get milk without a phone or I'm in a panic, right? And we drove across the country with a book, a book of maps and a phone under 18 and no phone. Right. And like, just trusted that like we get paid. Right. And you know, at that level, no money for hotels. Really. We weren't even quite at the level where it's like, can you sneak five guys in a hotel room that's supposed to have three on one night? And if you could, it's like somebody has got to sleep in the van to make sure the gear doesn't get stolen. And it's going to sound terrible, but I've heard Guns N' Roses tell the story, so I'll tell the story. You hope somebody in the band hooks up with some girl that's got a really nice apartment so everybody can sleep in the in the living room, right? And you're not, like, sleeping. You know what I mean? Like, that's the level that was, that was at, right? And you couldn't necessarily go across the country. Like, you couldn't even play 100 shows in a row if you wanted to then. So this is how it's the same. It's the same now where I sort of see the most successful hardcore bands – like Madball, like Agnostic Front, going out for like five shows in the East Coast and back home, take a week off. Five shows in the West Coast, take, go home. Five shows in the South, go home. Go to Europe for 14 days, come home. 
that cadence, right? Like none of these bands even today are U2. What's the same is this cadence of like little bursts of act, little bursts of regional activity are the part that actually is the same. Even the part of that is different. And we were only really, you know, made it to the second stage of places like this is the scale. What I couldn't believe is like, you know, post reunion, looking out even at our second stage at Graz Rock and seeing 5,000 people or like playing at an intersection on a stage at like my fest in Berlin and literally people in all four street directions, as far as you could see, like that wasn't hardcore, it, you know, back when we did it the first time and just see the whole genre and the whole movement scaled that much was crazy. But, you know, to your point about like, what's different, I've got like a corporate job and I'm touring, forget the gear and all that stuff. I'm touring with like, two laptops, two smartphones, a MiFi. like, you know, I'm working between shows. There's a, you know, the Sprinter, you know, we never got to the tour bus level, but like the Sprinter's got, you know, Xbox in it. <laughs> you know, it's a whole different level, the level of electronic support. You don't get lost and everybody's calling everybody all the time is, you know, is where it's really different. You know, kind of kind of going off what you're talking about a second ago, like with the pockets or going different places, which I, I assume, you know, yeah, you may not get a scene in like, including hardcore, you're not going to get a hardcore scene in every city or town and all that. I'm wondering, like, you know, besides Massachusetts and Boston and all that, like, what kind of pocket of the country or even the what maybe it wasn't even the United States, like, where do you think kind of embraced DYS in the beginning outside of, you know, your own her home turf? Like, I mean, was there a place that you remember when you first toured or even maybe before you toured where it's like, you know, a lot of the records sold in a certain area or yeah. when you play, like you got a good reception there. And also, by the way, what's crazy now is like with the tools on like Spotify and stuff, I know exactly where all those pockets are, right? <laughs> like I, I, I know what countries, I know what cities. It's crazy what you know now. My recollection is there was some kind of set hardcore markets and you know, some of them are around college towns, especially in the Midwest. So here's what I recall. You could do Providence, New York, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Virginia Beach, right? Harrisburg, maybe Boston in a run. That worked. You could do that a few times a year. You could jump the country and do like Los Angeles, maybe two in Los Angeles in different parts, San Francisco, maybe Ventura and be done. You could do the Midwest, right? Like kind of where the touch and go footprint was, you know, you could do like Michigan, Ohio and largely college towns up there, you know, sort of if you think like Northeast into like upper South or like Midwest, it's, it's college towns, it's college pockets. We never really went South of Georgia ever the first time around, like post reunion we did. But it didn't really feel – I felt like Florida at that time was really like a death metal scene. Like if you think about like that's right before kind of Manson and those guys came out of that scene, right? And there could have been one and we just weren't plugged into it. But like we ended up doing that whole Florida thing, you know, where you could do like five shows in Florida post-reunion. And then there were these teeny little islands. Like I don't know. Was there a club? What was it called? The Outhouse or something? Like in the middle of nowhere in like the Midwest, right? It was like a little shack. And it was like a thousand miles on either side to a show or 500 miles on either side to a show. And you could also play Colorado. But like there were these huge swaths of miles that you, there just literally wasn't a show or there wasn't a show that we knew of, you know, there might've been house shows, but there weren't club shows. Was there any kind of, this interests me too, you being from, uh, you know, Massachusetts and everything, like obviously some really good music has come out of Boston, hardcore being a huge one, but like, were there any scenes, I mean, you know, not even now, but kind of back in the day, DYS starting and kind of in that time where like, were there any other pockets in the New England region where like might surprise people there was like a strong local music scene? Because I always like to, I always hope there's these pockets, almost like you're talking about where there's music scenes, maybe I don't know about them. But I want to know that like somewhere in Vermont, they had like this insane house show scene in the 80s or something like that. I mean, were, were there any pockets like that that would surprise people to know what that was going on kind of in uh, New England back then? Nashua, New Hampshire, right? The Bruisers ended up coming out. I think the Bruisers were like the biggest export out of Nashua, right? And then the singer of the Bruisers went on a Dropkick Murphys. But like New Hampshire and Portland, Maine. And Western Mass was a hotbed, right? This is just like pre-proto Dinosaur Jr., like Deep Wound. 
And honestly, if I think about New England and the continuity, it's got to be college towns, right? So you've got out in like Western Massachusetts, you've got the five colleges, right? And that sort of bleeds into like UVM, you know, you can come down from UVM and see a show there. And then you've got UNH, and then you've got the colleges around Portland. And I just think between the college students and kind of the kids of college professors, like, I mean, I think we have to remember, like, punk rock and hardcore was largely like a middle class movement in America, you know, kind of like, unlike, you know, London, where, you know, punk was very much like a working class movement. So there was a lot of traction around college towns. And post DYS, you know, if you think about like post hardcore bands going out and making real money, it was the college circuit, right? If you think about like, you kind of move into Buffalo Tom, the checks were coming out of like the college circuit, right? Dinosaur Jr. Like you could make a real living playing colleges, you know, mighty, many Boston's like there were, there were big checks chasing colleges a little after us. Nice. Nice. Kind of, you know, actually speaking of that with, cause you're, you're totally right with college towns, including the eighties. I mean, you got college rock and college radio yeah. your thing. Like, was there any, like, you know, being in Boston, was there, now that I'm thinking about that, like, when you think of goals or whatever for hitting the road, like, was there attention on, like, hey, we want to go play, like, New York City or get in that side? Or is it more of, hey, like you were just talking about, there's all these pockets in New England, like, forget trying to go to New York, like, we have all these different places to hit in our region. I mean, was that even a thought back then? If you kind of get what I'm saying. It was absolutely a thought because I think every band wants to play in front of the largest amount of people possible, regardless of your scene, regardless of your commercial sensibility, right? You always want to grow your audience. And New York was New York. Like Boston had a great music scene, but people didn't break out of Boston. So I have to say like later, once the idea of sort of like breaking, you know, and like there's actually a path to quote unquote breaking from hardcore, right? You know, as we get into proto crossover, you sort of felt like you had to go to New York to showcase, you had to go to New York to be seen, you had to go to New York to be noticed. And also Boston, at any given time, there was probably only one club or two clubs that would support hardcore shows, where there was a number of different venues in New York. And also New York had a very developed scene. So, you know, if you played, I mean, the channel was big, and I think channel was 850. But like if you, you know, generally like the Rats 300, you go rent the VFW hall, that's 300. The channel might have been five or 700. But like if you wanted to go and play in front of a thousand people, you were now thinking like Irving Plaza, the first rock hotel. Like if you started to want to break into like, I want to play with the Misfits in front of a thousand people, you had to go to New York, right? Like you weren't going to, you weren't going to necessarily get a thousand people in Boston. And so between the draw of, you know, New York having a very credible scaled hardcore scene and the venues, we were very much drawn there, you know, and again, because it's hardcore, we're not thinking about radio, right? So if, if you're a normal band, you're thinking about like, where are the 50,000 watt stations, right? We're, we're not thinking about, you know, we're not looking at like, where are you getting spins? Go play where you get spins, right? Or even now, if we were trying to be like, what 10 cities have the most DYS streams, right? Like, we're literally like, okay, there's clubs there and there's people there. Right. And also there was product there because I think what we also forget in this world of ubiquitous distribution, just distrib like you could show up in a city and there'd be no product to buy unless you brought it with you. Right. Like these punk labels are not buying end caps. Right. Well, like, if, you, if you, it, it, yeah, if you like release a record at a major label, one of the points of that in fact, it, at those days is like they're buying end caps along your tour. Right. So your record is always front and center in every city you're in. We'd often go play a city and the only way to buy the record was from us at the merch table. Right. And, you know, now we live in a world of like ubiquitous distribution. Our music is everywhere. That's really interesting. And that is a very good point. I mean, like, yeah, you're not, I'm sure you're not in like the biggest, you know, I mean, little punk labels aren't getting in tower records onto the end cap, right. whatever. Like they're not doing that. You don't have the money. And but we're but we're at Rat Cage in New York. We're always at Rat Cage in New York, right? And every city like that has a Rat Cage, right? So there were so if you start thinking about those like bigger you know metropolitan areas like DC, New York, Philadelphia, there is an ecosystem, right? So these are like ground up analog ecosystems built around these genres of music. You know, kind of, kind of uh, going off what you're talking about too with venues, like you were talking there. Like, did you guys have to? Because I've talked to a lot of people who were in this, like, this New Jersey pop punk ska scene of the '90s, and one of the craziest things about it is that there weren't venues to play, but there was a scene, so you had to go find the unconventional places. Like, were you guys playing? Did you kind of back then? Was there that time where I mean, now you're playing, you know, you're playing pretty bona fide venues and stuff, but I mean. Was there that time where you had to go find the unconventional? Maybe there's people who want to come to the show, but you ain't getting like a club or a theater or something. You got to go find a place that might not normally have music. Was that a, was that a big thing back then? 
it's a huge thing. A- and also it was one of the things I think that made hardcore different and special, right? So at any given time, A, all ages was super important to us, right? And it was, there weren't a lot of clubs that you could get to do an all ages show because they didn't make bar, right? So if they didn't make bar, you took away like a big piece of their P and L on that show. They don't necessarily want to open the doors, which is by the way, how these matinee shows started, right? Because, Hey, I don't want to give up my night show because it's got alcohol for a show that doesn't have alcohol. But if I can add a second show a couple hours earlier, even if it doesn't have alcohol, it's almost zero additional overhead and I can make some more money, right? If you're a club owner, which is why I think looking back, why hardcore ended up in matinees, because it was the way to sort of bridge that get all ages and not like, you know, bankrupt the club. B, then there'd always be some issue around like stage diving and slamming and some war with bouncers. And so a club would open their door to hardcore for a few months and there'd be some sort of incident and then the door closed, right? And so you'd go through these times where the rat was closed, the channel was closed, nobody wanted to do hardcore and you had to do your own venues. You had to, you had to rent churches, you had to rent VFW halls. Now that's more work on the bands. Now you're separating strata of like this DIY hustle and bands who are willing to like go book their own stuff versus bands that weren't right. And a lot of the old line punk bands in Boston were still in this do it for me world, right? Where they want, they just want to show up and have it done for them. They want a record label to sign them. They want to pay to make their own records. They don't want to distribute their own records. Right. So we got some traction that they didn't get because of that, but also frankly, the economics are better. Like if I look back at like one of the things that made Boston hardcore different, it's like, look at the back line, right? Like, you know, it's not punk rock back line, right? There's, you know, multiple marshals, there's multiple SVTs. That was largely funded on the improved P&L of uh, your own venue, right? I'm not playing the rat for 50 bucks. I'm playing like a VFW hall for $1,000. It's, it's very different economics. That's really interesting. That's the kind of stuff that's like, so I'm 31. So like even like hardcore I think I know it as more of a bigger side, you know, as we're talking yep. about, even even now, as we talk about a record for its 40th anniversary, obviously earlier on the scene's different. It's a different place. You don't have the, you know, you can't reissue things. Is, you're, you're making something new here. You know yeah. I mean? There's not a lot beforehand. You're kind of, you're kind of starting off, which even that, I mean, we're talking about the hardcore scene and stuff. Was it, you know, yes, the venues don't sound like they existed, but I mean, did that scene still exist in Boston when when DYS started, or did that kind of come later? Like, like was there still a scene in Boston, just not the venues to play early on, or did that kind of build as time went on? Well, I mean, it became a natural evolution out of punk, right? Like, I think when it started, the subsets were so small that they were together. Mm-hmm. You, you know, like hardcore bands and punk bands would sort of play together and have the same venues, and then they diverged on a values basis. And they also diverged on a, I mean, we didn't ever use the word business model, but on a business model basis. And I I sort of alluded to that earlier, which is like, A, you've got drugs and punk rock decadence, right? Which is actually not that different from like the mainstream rock and roll decadence of like groupies and gack and, and smack that like we rejected in like main, you know, mainstream music. And then you've also got, DIY versus do it for me. Right. So you've got like punk bands trying to get signed to labels and you've got hardcore bands making their own records, you know, and then you've got like a group of people where drugs and sex are very important and a group of people who are more focused on like positive values. And so they end up diverging and living, you know, sort of in parallel universes with a bit of tension. And I don't think just value tension. It was also, I think there's some jealousy from punk because we were so DIY that frankly, we kind of eclipsed them. And by eclipsed them, I mean like we certainly didn't eclipse like a mission of Burma, but just generally there were more punk record. There were more hardcore records coming out because we were making more hardcore records ourselves. And there were more like, and these bands are playing for like $50 a night playing every Friday night at the rat. And like, we're not playing that often. So it's eventized, right? So like if SSD only plays Boston once a year, which is another thing we stole from Al Burrell, it's an event, right? And if, you know, the outlets are playing every Friday night at the rat, like I love the outlets, they're a great band, but you know, you're thinking if you're tired, eh, I'll just see them next Friday night. But if I don't go to that SSD show, I may not see him for a year. So it's also this weird idea that kind of hurt us economically, which is to almost act like a touring band in your own city, right? Like DYS and SSD didn't necessarily play in Boston more times than a touring band would play in Boston, even though it's our own city, 
if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it does. No, I've definitely seen those. I mean, there's some band, but also I've had this conversation where if you stay within that local scene too much, you're never going to, you won't get out. Yes. If you guys are playing all the time and like you're saying, you play the one venue where 800 people show up every time you play, that's great. But if you never go elsewhere, only that place will 800 people come out. If you go elsewhere, there's not a, so eight people won't come out. Right. You kind of have to get off those stomping grounds at some point. Totally. And the interesting thing is I cannot stress how analog it was where we found each other physically, right? We didn't find each other on the internet. We found each other in Kenmore Square on Friday night and, you know, rummaging to the racks of Newbury Comics on Saturday and Sunday, like, you know, at shows, like it was such a small world. That even if you saw somebody on the street that had like a black flag button, like, you are in my tribe, so we're going to talk to each other, even though we're total strangers, because the tribes were so small. So it was like the, it's highly analog world of connection. That's so cool. That's really neat talking about that, about all of that, getting into uh, getting into that. Another thing I did want to ask too. I mean, you were talking hardcore and all that. Being there early on for like that straight edge hardcore scene and everything, I'd love to know like what would you say were some of the wildest misconceptions of that scene? Was there anything you ever heard about your own scene and your old music and bands that you're just like, where did that come from? Like, you know, from like the outsiders and stuff. Were they really big misconceptions when you look back to the scene back then? I'm not sure they were giant misconceptions. I think one of the misconceptions was this idea that Boston was like violence driven and like straight edge driven became mythically larger than it was. And what I mean by that is, you know, as Alberos talked about, all of SSD wasn't even straight edge, but they were a straight edge band, right? All of DYS wasn't straight edge, but we were a straight edge band. The scene and the image seems to be defined by DYS, SSD, negative effects, right? Gangrene, Jerry's Kids, and the FUs were living a totally different ethos, right? But somehow got lumped into that, into our ethos, right? It's like the Boston crew are going to slap your beer out of your hand and pin you down and shave your head. Like, I literally remember... We're hanging out at Radio Beat with Husker Du the night they're doing backup vocals. And they had, they had played a club in Boston and, you know, they knew Lou Giordano and he just invited them down to hang. And it became, hey, do you, you want to sing on this? We kind of need a gang vocal. And they were just peppering us with questions like, you know, because if you remember early Husker Du, right, like long hair, you know, not straight edge, very early kind of like break the mold punk wise. And they'd be like, is it true that if we show up with long hair, people are going to hold us down and shave our heads? Is it true that people are going to knock beers out of our hands? You know, Choke Choke has famously gone on saying, you know, my job isn't to break down, you know, myths. It's to, like, make them larger. Right? <laughs> but uh, that's, that's one of the misconceptions, you know. And, and I think the second thing related to that is that Boston was a straight-edge city. Boston was absolutely not a straight-edge city. And, you know, I lost a lot of friends to substances and suicide related to substances who are not necessarily part of the straight edge world, you know, who lived in that kind of more traditional punk squat world. And I am just thankful that whatever higher power exists that like, as I enter this city, as like a 14 year old or a 15 year old from the suburbs that I wandered into a door that was like driven by straight edge as opposed to like I wandered in a door where somebody's like, Hey, you want some Coke? Like, you know, now we're, I mean, I would say, yeah, it has a better, it has a better ending and it's a lot more productive. It's a little better off. I think you are in life. Absolutely. But I could have walked my could. first touch could have been the club next door where there was a whole different thing going on. I mean, literally, that's a really good point. That's crazy when you put it in that perspective, but you're not wrong. You know? That's yeah. Really, it's nuts, right? It really is. It's, it's extremely interesting. As we, you know, as we start to like close this out, I'm having a blast talking about music and the scene and all that back then, but like to bring it back to brotherhood, I mean, again, 40 years, obviously people like this record uh, for you is like, an, it, you know, not from the outside looking in, but I mean, you, you being a part of it, what would you say? Maybe it's a hard thing to do, but like, what would you credit brotherhood still being so beloved and why people still care about it? Like, why are people still talking about this record 40 years later? If you had to guess. I would have to say it's about the passion and the message. Because if I look back, it's not the songwriting. It's not the sonics, right? It's not the recording quality. It's an honest expression of a moment in time. And it's a call to action to a set of beliefs 
that I've really lived by since then. You know, I credit a lot of things to those ethos. I ascribe my professional success to those ethos. I ascribe my physical health to those ethos. I ascribe the son I'm raising to raising him with those ethos. But it's the message. It's got to be the thing that resonates because when I look back, it's not the best sounding record. It's not the best produced record. It's not the best played record. But it's absolutely honest and emphatic about a message that I think is like deeply important even today. Nice, nice. I I would agree. I mean, I mean, it's an amazing. I still think it's an amazing record. And also, I think that goes to to show too. Again, you don't need sleek production. You know, to me, music doesn't need sleek production or any any crazy. You don't need to toy with it for years and years. Sometimes the best stuff you bash out. Just four guys in the studio, just bashing it out, basically. You know, totally that, that kind of thing. But uh, any, you know, I mean, Brotherhood being the big thing. But I mean, anything else uh, this year or coming up? in the world of DYS, just in the world of a uh, Jonathan and Nastis or anything else coming up you want to tell people about? Yeah. You know, I don't want to be a bummer after such a positive conversation, but we had been planning as a band to do some shows around announcing this. And originally the record was supposed to come out two months earlier than it had. But my brother in this for 40 years, Dave Smalley had a big cancer battle and some complications around that really put him on his heels medically. We had to cancel the shows and we had to move the date and there's currently a GoFundMe for Dave. You know, he's got a lot of kind of like post-hospitalization care he needs. And he's, he's on the rebound and he's on the mend. And I look forward to, he'll be in a place where I can share a stage with him. But, you know, if for anybody who can help Dave out, you know, we, we've decided to give all the proceeds from this record to Dave to help him get back on his feet. Oh, and nice. so are there any fans of Dave Smalley, not just from DYS, but Dag Nasty, all down by law don't sleep you know dave i always said like you know I, i'm the i'm the weak link musically in this band like i'm the one who's had the benefit of going along for the ride you know I, i've had my areas where i've made contributions but i'm the musical weak link dave smalley's canon i think stands with any american punk slash hardcore singer songwriter yeah. and so if anybody who listens to this is a fan of dave's Google the GoFundMe if you can help out Dave with whatever you can. We want to get him back closer to his family and get him the rehabilitation he needs so he can be on stages again. And until we know what that looks like, I can't make any promises about what DYS is going to do. But my hope out of my brotherhood for him is he's in a position where we can stare, share a stage again and we can celebrate this record live, which is what we plan to do from the beginning. Very nice. Very nice. No, we will. If you're listening on the podcast, I'll make sure we have a link in the uh, description in the show notes for the thank uh, you so much oh yeah absolutely thank you so much i was wondering as well didn't want to you know i didn't want to yeah. pry or anything but was wondering about a dave update so good to hear that stuff and uh yeah for uh people who put the uh go fund me out there for them and everything on top of that where do we uh where do we go find the record where can we find you online all of sure. all the good stuff plug away sure so if you're in the states go to bridge nine records if you're in germany go to cortex you know it's a it's available in a lot of different places it's out at, it's out of distribution but those are probably the two best direct sources to get who have been supporters of ours for a long time you know me i'm just on social media as me trying to do my day job and you know be an inspiring dad and you know pass on the love of music to my son who's seven and may get his first drum set soon but uh <laughs> section in the house got some bass and drums in there <laughs> Well, it's really cute. Right now, mostly I've got this old 1965 uh, uh, Fender Malibu. It's like a 60s, probably cheapy at that time, acoustic guitar with a bolt-on neck and a Stratocaster headshot, a headstock shape. And I can imagine like it was marketed then as like the Fender Malibu, like sit on the beach in Malibu, you know, at the, at, you know, and like sing to the girl, right? But like my son and I sit and like he plays his drums and I strum on this acoustic guitar and he's got his little band called Witch Star. And, uh, oh, nice. We, we write witch star songs. Nice, nice. Maybe we'll have you on again talking <laughs> a new witch star record at one time. Uh, there point. you go. <laughs> Very nice, Jonathan. I mean, total a blast talking to you. As we close this out, anything else to uh, let the good people know? Anything else we've missed? Have we uh, not covered anything? No, and I just want to thank all of our fans for the support and the love and remembering who we are 
all along the way, from the first record to the second record to when we reunited in 2009 and thought it was going to be one and done. And we end up doing 50 shows that I never, I got a, I got a gift. I got a second bite at the apple, which people rarely get to do with a whole lot more understanding of the world. Right. So I got a chance to kind of go back and do it the way in a lot of ways that a little bit more time and maturity would have taught us the first time around with like the greatest bunch of musicians and the greatest bunch of guys in the world. Dave, Franz Stahl, who's a legend, oh, yeah. Alpa Hanish, who's another kind of Boston export, who, you know, again, has seen the top of the world, like Platinum Records. And, uh, and Adam Porras, who's got a new record on Hellcat, the Calamatics, with uh, Tim Timebaum. So I, I'm just, it's just been, I want to thank everybody who supported. I want to thank you for supporting. I want to thank the guys who I've been lucky enough to play with. And, and again, it's just, music is a gift. And being able to play it and age is a gift. And it, it, to come back and get a chance to talk about it and do it is something I never possibly would have imagined happening. And, you know, that's, that's what's been incredible to me and what I'm most thankful for. No, that is awesome. I mean, it's great. Like, you get, the, you get another chance at it and getting to do it again. You know, myself and many others, very happy to uh, hear more music from you and everything. So uh, glad you're uh, still releasing stuff. But, uh, yeah. I'm Anthony Merchant. We're talking to Jonathan Anastas of DYS. We got Brotherhood 40th Anniversary Edition out now on Bridge Nine Records. If you're listening to the radio show, I mean, the radio show is three hours. We'll probably just play uh, Brotherhood front to back. I think I think we got more enough time to do that, and uh, we'll play some uh, more. So we'll play some. Uh, we'll play a bunch of DYS and more. So we'll get into that. But you are tuned in to the Power Chord Hour. <laughs> 